In today's video, I'm going to be sharing with you one of the most exciting papers that I have read in MECFS research for quite some time. It's certainly a paper which utilizes cutting edge technology, and it's something which I think can go a long way towards uh, clarifying the mechanistic underpinnings of the disease, proving or disproving certain hypotheses about it, and which may ultimately be the kind of research that helps us to move towards effective treatments in the future. My name is Patrick Usher. I'm an MECFS patient and author of the book Understanding MECFS and Strategies for Healing. And to cut straight to the chase, today we are talking about what happens when you bioengineer human muscle tissue in a laboratory and expose that tissue to the blood from MECFS patients. Does that muscle tissue remain the same or does it start to show signs of perhaps profound dysfunction when it suddenly finds itself in the environment of the MECFS blood. Now, this comes from a paper from Spain, published just two months ago in the journal Biofabrication, with the title Metabolic Adaptation and Fragility in Healthy 3D in Vitro Skeletal Muscle Tissues Exposed to Chronic Fatigue Syndrome and Long COVID-19 Sera. And so what this team did in a nutshell is they first of all bioengineered muscle tissue using stem cells and muscle cells and they actually matured that muscle tissue first of all for six days and then they exposed it to a solution containing 5% sera or the blood from MECFS and long COVID patients and then they observed what happened in the coming days. And part of those observations included actually using electrical current stimulation of the muscles to see how they were contracting. And then they also dived in to actually look at a very deep level what was happening with the mitochondria in uh, this muscle tissue. But before I tell you about my four key takeaways from this study, I think it's worth pausing to just think about why do a study like this? The vast majority of MECFS research is done in vivo. That is to say, it's done on a living human being. And this is the foundation of science and medical research, and it is what is the most essential component for actually understanding what's happening. But an in vitro study like this, a study done in a lab, even though it has some limitations because it can't capture the full complexity of, um, of everything that happens within you know, a whole living biological system like the human body, it can nevertheless be very good at capturing the nitty gritty of mechanistic detail. You can actually see exactly what processes are happening in a specific part of the body, like muscle tissue, in response to a specific catalyst. And this can really help elucidate aspects of the disease pathophysiology. More precisely, you know, when you study, for example, you do blood work of an MECFS patient, you are getting, or a biopsy, you're getting a, a, a specific data point from a specific moment in time. And when you have that data, you can then, you know, you're left with questions. Why do we have this result? What could be feeding into this? And you come up with various hypotheses that could be, you know, tested in other studies. But with something like this, where you can actually trace very clearly mechanistically what's happening at any time point in the investigation, you can then actually answer some of the questions that are raised by the research that is done into the living MECFS patient. So the way I would look at this is, you know, in vitro and in vivo are complementary scientific processes. They can support each other, they can generate questions and answers that can then, you know, help the overall field move forward. Okay, so let's now come to my four key takeaways from this amazing research. The first is that after 48 hours, they actually used electrical volt stimulation to force the muscle tissue to contract. And they observed the differences between uh, what happened in the healthy muscle tissue versus the diseased tissue. And what they found in the diseased tissue was a profoundly reduced capacity for the muscles to contract, to have force, to sustain activation. And basically, in the words of the authors of this paper, the tissue of the MECFS and long COVID patients became quote, severely compromised. So I'm going to show you now three diagrams from the study which can back this up. The first shows the maximum force of the muscles. And you can see here that in the MECFS and long COVID group, the maximum force was generally much lower. Similarly, the power of the muscles was much lower in the MECFS and long COVID group. And finally, the capacity of the muscles to contract forcefully and then relax and then contract forcefully and then relax, as you can see from this diagram here, was 
basically down the toilet in the MECFS and long COVID groups. And so straight off the bat, we have this really convincing, you know, evidence of just how the blood on its own of an MECFS patient can induce this really dysfunctional state within the muscles. And we know, of course, from other studies that hand grip strength and the capacity of the muscles to sustain force and so on is severely diminished in MECFS patients. Okay, moving on to the second key takeaway from this study, the finding of high calcium levels within the muscle cells. So basically, if you have a situation where the muscle cells are filled with calcium, that actually is a very dangerous state of affairs. And it can also play into damaging and diminishing the mitochondria inside a cell. So in the context of an illness of mitochondrial dysfunction and depletion, this finding is particularly important. I'm going to come back to it again towards the end of the video, because in particular, finding from this paper is very important in light of uh, the overall state of MECFS science at the moment, and can really help us to know, you know, which researchers are probably moving the field in the right direction. We now come to the third key takeaway, which is related to the last one, and this is a change in mitochondrial function and morphology or shape. So this is what the authors wrote. Moreover, the mitochondria assumed not only the signature globular geometry observed during fragmentation, but also adopted a toroidal conformation, indicating altered fusion dynamics, dissipation of mitochondrial membrane potential, and cytoskeletal detachment. And so basically, to put that into more understandable terms, the mitochondria started to find themselves up Schitt's Creek and without a paddle. More seriously, what they observed was that the mitochondria were starting to exhibit more fusion than fission. Now, normally speaking, for mitochondria to maintain their health, they go through cycles of uh, fusion and fission, you know, coming apart and coming back together. But in this case, there was a kind of adaptive, likely stress response where they were focusing more on fusion. And basically, you know, what the authors were, were showing is that the mitochondria had become under a lot of stress and their normal functions were actually being broken down. And the fourth and final takeaway from this paper relates to something that actually you might think is a bit unexpected. And that is that in some other ways, the mitochondria were actually upregulating their activity. And in particular, they were increasing their oxygen consumption and increasing their glycolysis, that is to say, creating energy from glucose. Now, this is interesting because you would expect that perhaps these processes would actually downregulate. But we have to remember that what we're seeing in this paper is essentially the interaction of healthy muscle tissue with diseased blood. This kind of initial upregulation of oxygen consumption and of uh, glycolysis in the mitochondria is likely a kind of initial adaptation. The mitochondria basically sense this is a dangerous situation, we're under some kind of assault, uh, we need to cope with this, and so they actually upregulate their attempts to produce energy. Now, in the long term, this kind of upregulation, which the authors here suggest is a stress response, is simply not going to be sustainable. And indeed, what they find in this paper is that, you know, as you're moving towards day three or four and five, things were getting much more uh, dysfunctional at a mitochondrial level. So it seems to be that there's this adaptation, which then cannot actually be maintained in the long run. And this probably mimics what actually happens to people when they come down with MECFS for the first time. So what the authors say is that we propose that skeletal muscle tissue in MECFS and long COVID-19 progresses through a hypermetabolic state, that is to say an excessive metabolic state, leading ultimately to severe muscular and mitochondrial deterioration. This is the first study to suggest such a transient metabolic adaptation. Okay, so those are the four key takeaways from the study. The muscle uh, contractile strength was extremely compromised. The muscle cells were overloaded with calcium, a very damaging mechanism. The mitochondria became dysfunctional. And there was also this kind of stress response whereby the mitochondria were trying to really upregulate their energy production, which is likely what actually happens in the very initial stages of the disease. Okay. So this has been a really fascinating paper, but what are the overall conclusions that I would suggest we draw from it? Well, at a very obvious level, this kind of study is very useful because uh, it can counteract two of the most prevalent myths 
One being that ME-CFS patients are just deconditioned. There's nothing particularly special about deconditioned blood that could create such profound changes so quickly. So that can be immediately discarded. And the other, of course, is that, you know, the, the whole idea that ME-CFS is psychosomatic. I mean, you know, you, you can't have blood that actually does this kind of stuff if that is what the problem is. I mean, maybe someone might suggest that the blood itself is psychosomatic, but really uh, it's not something that you could seriously entertain. Even though, of course, the person I'm about to introduce to you would maintain such a view at all costs. Hello, my name is Professor Mark Thickenson, and I don't like this research at all. I really don't. I think it's dreadful. Absolutely dreadful. I have researched this fruitcake disease for my entire academic career. I have written so many papers, so many papers, all of them peer-reviewed by myself. I have absolutely unequivocally shown and proven that every single ME-CFS patient is a morbidly obese, two utterly hysterical, and three a woman. If you want to counteract the kind of nonsense proposed by professors like Mark Thickenson, then I suggest to check out the sponsor of this video, Turney. Turney is a new artificial intelligence platform specifically designed for a small group of conditions, including ME-CFS and long COVID. And what it's actually done is it has indexed pretty much everything to do with these diseases from the last 10 years. That's every single paper, every single conference, transcripts of podcasts and YouTube videos, uh, open patient discussions on forums. And so when you ask Turney a question about your situation, it will actually give you a very deep answer drawing upon all of these different sources. This artificial intelligence platform is truly a game changer for ME-CFS patients, free for the first three weeks and $2 a week thereafter, but you can get an extra 10% off if you use the code PATRICK10. For information on how to sign up, please check out the links down below. And from my perspective, another really important takeaway point from this paper actually relates to the research that I personally find the most promising in the ME-CFS world, which is the unifying model of Professors Klaus Wirth and Carmen Scheibenbogen. For those who don't know, they have actually you know, taken nearly all of the pre-existing ME-CFS research findings and asked, you know, what can unify these together? How does A lead to B lead to C? And, you know, what actually can make all of these findings, which seem random, you know, how can we actually join them up into a unifying model, which I think kind of has to happen if we're going to move the ME-CFS research world forward. But I think, you know, what's so exciting about this paper that I'm talking about today is the finding of the muscle calcium overload. Because for Wirth and Scheibenbogen, this muscle calcium overload is an essential component of ME-CFS. And it's more something that they have proposed, uh, but it's very hard to prove, uh, you know, in an in vivo setting. Now, they point to the finding of um, muscle tissue necrosis, muscle tissue death during post-exertional malaise, as found by the wonderful research team in the Netherlands led by Rob Vust, um, because it's most likely that the only thing that can explain that is muscle calcium overload. But what this paper does, you know, in a laboratory setting, is it actually shows there actually is this tendency towards an accumulation of calcium. And so the paper from Spain actually greatly increases the likelihood that the Wirth and Scheibenbogen model of ME-CFS is correct. I think that, you know, there's other questions that this paper raises. I think it would be fascinating to do a study where you actually um, take the blood of ME-CFS patients who are in a crash. Now that might involve traveling to them to take the blood samples rather than them traveling to a laboratory. To actually expose healthy muscle bioengineered tissue blood during post-exertional malaise and see does that create an even more pronounced impact I think that would be a fascinating study. Would it, for example, show an even more prevalent muscle calcium overload? I would predict that it would. And I also wonder, you know, could this kind of approach actually help ME-CFS research prioritise certain therapeutic agents? Because if you could, you know, induce diseased muscle tissue and then expose it to potential therapeutics, for example, Klaus Wirth's my total cure pill, and then see, you know, how does that tissue respond? You know, if there's a kind of positive response there, then maybe that could really kind of make a, an even greater case for funding certain lines of uh, therapeutic research over others. So I think this cutting edge area has a lot of potential for the ME-CFS world. I find it very exciting, and I think it's something that, um, you know, only moves us forward. So that's it for this video. 
please leave your thoughts and comments down below. I always really enjoy reading your own insights into the research that I'm sharing. Um, please consider checking out my growing Patreon and research support community. It's only $7 a month. We have a private forum where we support each other. Once a month Zoom calls where we also pool our ideas uh, for uh, about treatment strategies and research that we're interested in. And yes, I will see you in the next video. I'm kind of doing a theme at the moment, which is these kinds of videos where you put the blood into you know, different contexts and see what happens. I think the next one will be about what happens to mice when you give them MECFS blood. But it's yet another thing that might just put the likes of Professor Mark Thickenson out of business. Did he just have a go at me again? I really don't like this fellow. I really don't. I don't. I'm going to go away right now and write a paper to prove, to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that the blood of MECFS patients is itself psychosomatic.